I am super excited, not only because it's Friday, but because I have the pleasure of speaking to Command Sergeant Major McGinnis, who is a 68 Tango. Woo! I'm also a 68 Tango. Uh, Sergeant Major, could you just give us a little bit of your, your background and why being a 68 Tango is so important to me? Sure. So, um, I am Sergeant Major Shana McGinnis. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. And I am a 68 Tango by trait animal care specialist. And then, of course, you um, become a 68 Romeo and then you become a 68 Zulu. But as, so when I was joining the Army, when I made the decision to join the Army, and I was at the recruiter's office and they asked me, like, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to, I want something medical. And I want something that I can use once I leave the service. So, and they said, well, hopefully that, that hopefully I will get that opportunity once I get to the MEP station. So I, I got to the MEP station and the only two options they had were mechanic and petroleum specialist. And I remember thinking to myself like, oh, okay, I'm not going to do that. All right. And so, the gentleman there, he said, hold on. And he called Fort Sam and he said, we can get you animal care. And I was like, oh, well, that's cool. I said, what would I be doing in animal care? And he said, you would have all the medical MOSs in animal care. So I said, oh, awesome, right? Because everybody knows being medical, they have, you have the nurses and you have the x-ray techs and you have the pharmacy techs and you have the lab techs. And you know, as a tango, you're all those texts, right? So I was like, okay, that, that sounds um, doable. So when I went to AIT and we were at AIT, they told, they told us that for many of us, we were going to research versus direct learning. And I was like, oh, okay, let's see how that works. And so for the majority of my military career, I've been on the research side. Can you so a little bit on that, Sergeant Major, because there are a lot of people that don't understand a research. I've never heard of a 68 Tango or even know what the Army does in, in regards to research. So research. So I've done biological research at Aberdeen Proving Ground, and that's testing different agents. And when I talk about biological, that's um, mustard agent and serum and things of that nature, biological. So I tested biological, and then my only vet clinic I ever had was in Naples, Italy. So I was there for a while, and then I came back to the States, and I went to Fort Dietrich, which is the... Let me take that back. Hold on. I already proved it was chemical research. So mustard agents, serum, chemical research, right? NBC, all chemical there. When I got to Fort Dietrich, it was biological. And biological, I mean, anthrax, botulism. And what, what we're doing in those different research facilities, we're testing those different agents to see how we can better protect the service members if they have to go into those environments. So that's what we're doing. So I've done chemical, biological, and I had a little experience in medical research. And that's when a doctor has a, um, they have an idea for a study and they researched everything and they're trying to see if this particular procedure would help a wounded service member. Does that make sense? Yes, Sergeant Major. So, and that, and that was the majority of my career from private E1, I came in as an E1, to start your first class. Like I said, it's been basically research. And what I what I liked about research, and I honestly, what I liked about research is the units that I was in, they sent you to school. Like education was really big to them. So the more education you had, the better you were to assist them with their protocols. And we were able to get our certification. So I have a laboratory animal 
technician and I had a laboratory animal technologist. So it's no. different applications that you can get. I'm sorry, what did you say? I said, no, that was great. That's really awesome. And, and so then after that, and I honestly, I've been in supervisory management positions after that. I was at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology as a time first class. And back then, their first sergeant position was an Air Force position. And as a first sergeant in the Air Force, you could be an E7. So when the slot came open, they said, look at me as an E7 to be the first sergeant. And I PCS to Korea for a year, worked at the 168 MMB, and came back to Maryland. It was the first sergeant for Public Health Command North at the time, which is now Public Health Command Atlanta. And after that, I went to Fort Bragg, which was a district then. Now it's an activity. And then Fort Knox was an activity. And then they sent me to the Sergeant Majors Academy. And after that, I've been in human medicine, not animal medicine. So being a low density MOS, do you feel that it took you a little bit longer to become a sergeant major? And do you think that is an impossible task with the new OML uh, system for promotion sergeant major? So I would say nothing is impossible, okay? So never sell yourself short. I would, I think for me, my only hiccup was that it, being in research and in my MOS, there's not too many deployment opportunities and back then everyone who had been selected was had been deployed so i was looked at the first two times i was looked at for sergeant major i i think it was important and the other issue i had was um the units that i, I was in for some reason the 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 award that I earned for PCS did not match my eval. Mm. And so it, it took me a while to get an MSM. I mean, let's be honest, my eval said I did great things, but my award really didn't say I did great things. So when you look at the AARs for Sergeant Major, it was at least one deployment and at least one MSM. And I knew I wasn't going to deploy because I haven't deployed yet. I never was asked to deploy, so I never denied deployment. But what I did was the units that I was stationed in, I ensured that what I was doing was helping the force. You know, I ensured that me working in chemical research gave me reassurance that if you wore D on your uniform, it would protect you, right? Um, me working in biological research um, gave me the trust that if we're going to give you this medication to take because of whatever illness or whatever happens to you, that this medication will work. So the jobs that the Army put me in, I did to the best of my ability. And I, I truly believe that we are an Army. And we have multiple MOSs and multiple jobs and multiple levels and working all together like a mosaic piece of art. That's what makes us the army. So everybody's not going to do that. You know, someone has to take care of the home front. Someone has to bring home those service members, our brothers and sisters that pay the ultimate sacrifice. Someone has to receive them on our end. And there are soldiers that they'll never deploy be a war fighter, but we all know that we support the war. If right. that makes Roger, it doesn't make sense, Sergeant Major. So people have told me over the course of my career to play the game. Can you, in your words, explain what playing the game means? Or, no. it, or is that even important to play the game? I've never heard it before. <laughs> So I, I really couldn't give any insight on playing the game. I would tell you, as long as you look at your career map, as long as you look at your career map, and if you look at your career map like a game board, I guess, 
you know, you could you could use that to dictate where you need to be. Um, but as far as playing the game, I really couldn't give you any insight because the game to me might be different to you. So I'm I'm not sure who who said that to you. <laughs> Um, when I was in AIT, I forgot his Ma Mark Rubio. Do you remember Mark Rubio? I think he retired as a master sergeant. It was who? Mark Rubio. I do not know them. They worked at the schoolhouse. Um, oh. So people, well, people have told me just play the game, just like show up, be on time, uh, right uniform, right attitude. Oh, I mean, that's that's not a game though. That's your duty, right? Roger that, Sergeant Major. That's what you're being, that's what's expected of you. So it's not really a game. When I, when I think of a game, I, I think of we're, we're playing a position, right? So if you're the quarterback, you have a certain position that you have to play as the kicker. But showing up when you're supposed to show up, being in a proper uniform, you're supposed to be in a proper uniform, stuff like that you're getting paid for. So, I mean, that's that's what you signed up for. So why wouldn't you put your best effort for it? Over. So for when it, in regards to coaching, mentor, and development, um, can you describe the roles of a coach and a mentor and how they both relate to professional development? Sure. So in my own words, right, as a coach, the coach is there to motivate you, to inspire you to get whatever task you need to get done. That's, that's coaching. On the range, I'm going to coach you. I'm going to make sure you're using the right breathing technique, make sure you're using the right trigger squeeze. That's coaching. Mentorship to me is a little different because I believe that you have the right to choose your own mentor. Mm. You know, in my career, there's been a few people that say, I'm going to provide you with some mentorship, and but their, their character was not really there. So I've always told people that you have the, you have the right to choose your mentor. I, I do believe in mentorship programs because there are some people out there that would never... Um, I would say they don't have the confidence mm. to confront or talk to a, a senior person to have that person to be a role model. So I do believe that mentorship programs are important. So you, so for those people out there that are scared to talk to a sergeant major, that I can guide them in the right direction, right? And when I when I talk about mentorship, you you want someone that's gonna be honest. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what you're doing well, what you're not doing well. I'm gonna tell you, you know, like, hey, let's reel this in. But I'm gonna be honest with you. So yes, Sergeant Major. So whose responsibility would would it be to initiate contact? Um, when it comes to mentorship or finding a mentor? So to me, I believe initially it is, it's the, it's the supervisor, it's the leader. It's the leader's responsibility to make first contact, right? Because you're the one who's gonna do that integration counseling for them. They have a sponsor, the sponsor is gonna bring that person to the unit and the unit and that soldier is gonna meet their NCO, who's their first line supervisor, that leader. That leader has a responsibility to provide, to initiate mentorship. Now on down the road, that soldier might find someone else that they also want them to be their mentor. So you can have multiple mentors. I've, I have about five good mentors that I I go to on a regular basis, depending on what the issue is. Some are in the army, some are outside the army, some have never been in the army. 
And do you think that's important as, as you navigate your career to ensure that you have some type of support or someone that you can call to give you guidance on specific situations within your career? I do. I think it's very important. I think, you know, this this is a team effort, right? So the Sergeant Major of the Army, he's teaching us this is my squad, right? And a, and a squad is, just, is not just one person. It's a whole team. And working together as a team, moving forward, you can get to the objective easier than everyone going in different directions. So I, I think it is important to have a team, a good group of mentorship. I think when you form that group of mentorship, it's not just a mentor mentee. Sometimes the roles change, right? Sometimes the mentee has become the mentor just based on what happened or experience or just life. But it is important to have a, a team, an, an honest team, right? You know, you don't, the biggest thing, the biggest issue I have in, a, in just being in a leadership role, right, is when a soldier does wrong, their battle buddy probably will be the first person to know that they are about to do something wrong. Perfect. And I would rather for that battle buddy to tell that soldier, like, hey, I, no, that's not a good idea, right? Instead of, it's, it's coming up to me and now I got to investigate it. And now your battle buddy doesn't want to be a snitch. So, because now your character is on the line and your battle buddy's character on the line. I, I think a, a true squad mentor friend battle buddy will tell you like, look, this is not good business. You have a lot to lose out there. Life is important. Your career is important. I need, I need you to um, tighten up your bootstring and march this line right here. So when that soldier doesn't have that mentorship and then when they come into your office for disciplinary action, what, what does that conversation look like? And what guidance or advice do you give that soldier that you see may be a good soldier, but just heading down the wrong path or making bad choices? So you coming in really low, but I'm going to, I think I got the gist of your question. So I, I would tell you when a soldier comes into my office after they have done something wrong, right? I I don't I don't just go in like, oh, you're getting punished. I'm gonna recommend the worst for you, right? What we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna we're gonna talk about what led you to that action, right? What what led you to do something wrong? Why did you feel or think you couldn't go to your first line readers? Why didn't you go to your NCO? Why didn't you use your NCO support channel? Why didn't you use your chain of command? Like, where where did that link? Where is that link missing? And don't get me wrong, there are some actions that you earn a certain punishment. So I'm not giving you anything. You you are getting what you earn based on the punishment, but. If there's a failure in leadership, if, if there's a failure in communication, if there's a failure in understanding, I'm gonna I'm gonna ensure that we do right by the soldier. And when I mean right by the soldier, I mean if they versus separating them from the army and demoting them, right, while they having a financial issue. I'm gonna to recommend to the commander that we probably do extra duty and suspend the the motion and the forfeit of pay, right? Because if you if you're having a financial issue and you went out there and you did something wrong and you couldn't trust your leader to tell them that you were struggling, that I'm not it's not my it's not my desire to make you struggle more. Does that make sense? Yes, Sergeant Major does. So, so we're gonna we're gonna look at the system. We're gonna see where the system is broken at. We're we're gonna see how did you get in this predicament and what we're gonna do to help you in this predicament. And if we can't help you, 
then we're gonna we're gonna look at that course of, course of action also. So what would you say would be some of the most common pitfalls or common uh, failure points that soldiers make when they have to come into your office or or have a conversation with you? So I, I think for me, when I was a young soldier, you know, I never, have I ever saw my CSM as a young soldier? Like the only time you saw the CSM is when you like you were really in trouble, right? It's like going to the principal's office at school. And most of the time the people who went there, they got cussed out, told they were no good. Um, it, it was just a bad overall event experience. So when a soldier comes to my office and and, and I realize the majority of the time that soldier is coming into my office is probably one of the lowest points in their lives. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not trying to make that hole deeper. What I am trying to do is get an understanding of what we could do better. I'm going to treat you grown because you are grown. You, you know, you're not a child. I understand that you are young to the army, so you are not familiar in that sense. And as your senior enlisted person, it's my responsibility to make sure that we have an understanding of what happened. But what I try to do is that I, I try to hear the person out, make sure I hear them, hear them out, that I'm actually listening and not speaking to them. And I want to make sure that they know that they can ask for help because just trying to get out at these corrosions in the army right now. When I, and when we talk about corrosions, you know, we're, we're talking about the sharp incidents and um, extremism when it comes to racism and suicide. And, and so you have to be, you have to have empathy mm -hmm. when people are coming to you. They, when someone did something wrong, they know they did, they did something wrong. I mean, if they're, they know they did it wrong. Um, so it's it's my job or our job to figure out why they why they did it and what can we do to help them to get on the the right track if possible. Did that answer your question? Because I said it came in a little broken. No, no, Sergeant Major, it did. But if you could just give a couple examples of the most common problems or the most common pitfalls that we as soldiers make throughout our careers? I, I think based on different places was the pitfalls. So um, I, I'm happy to say that I haven't had too many issues here. Yay. So, but most, most of the issues usually it's uh, financial. You know, Maryland is not a cheap place to live. And soldiers come in and they want to buy a house or buy a car, and all of a sudden, uh, they they can't support themselves financially. And next thing you know, I get a landlord calling, talk about um, the soldier left, and they didn't give a notice. And hey, they have a bill, or the soldier um, purchased something or was going to purchase something, especially online when it comes to like Craigslist and stuff like that. And they got the item, but they, they didn't pay the person. And all of a sudden, they get my phone number and they call me. So I have to talk to that soldier like, why didn't you pay that person? Why did you purchase that, purchase that certain item? Why are you living above your means? That's to me. That was the that was the biggest one. Um, as when I was a first sergeant, the biggest issue was child support. Like I would say, I probably got four or five IG complaints on a soldier because they weren't paying proper child support. So and. That was my biggest issue as a first time. But as Sergeant Major, I haven't had too many issues. So thank you. 
So what can we do as leaders? Do you think we should provide more financial classes or courses or um, educate soldiers on the on the army programs to better adapt them to their personal lives? So I think we should always promote the army programs, right? The ACS have they they have programs on finance. They have programs on budgeting. Uh, they they have different programs to help you make better choices. I I think honestly, some people have an issue with pride. They just you know they they get into this financial hold and they don't want to tell anyone and then they they're too proudful to come out and say I need help, but. I would tell you when you do these LDPs that you need to have ACS and AER and, and all those different agencies that are here to help soldiers. You need to have them a part of your developmental plan, especially for the, the junior enlisted, so they could get a better understanding of what help is out there for them. And there's a lot of programs that soldiers don't take advantage of, and they need to. I, I concur with that, Sergeant Major. Um, which has which has been more valuable in your career, your education or your experience? I would say experience. Um, yeah, it's always experience, right? Edu- education is good; it's a great thing. But when a when a soldier is in distress, they really don't care about how many degrees you have, right? What they care about is that the soldiers in a dark place, so they're down in that well, and as they're trying to make it, people are walking by them. You know, I'm the leader that's going to jump down in that well and tell them, like, hey, you're not alone. I've been in this well before, and I'm going to help you get out. So education has nothing to do with it when a person is struggling. It's all about experience. Was there a career set setback that you faced, which you later realized was an advantage? If yes, how did you navigate it, and what was the outcome? So, career setback. Not really a career setback. Uh, there's been times where I've had competing um, issues, and when I mean that, I mean my, my family in Ohio, they were going through something and I'm here in the army and there, and there was a time where um, I thought I would go up the army and go back home to help my family in Ohio. And my grandmother, of course, she was, she's the one who said, no, you know, we got this over here. So you, you focus in the, on the army. And I would tell you during, during that time, um, I probably wasn't the most focused on the army. So I wouldn't say someone set me back. I probably did it to myself, but I would say I have had leaders who, um, let me, let me just word this. I won't give you an example, right? So I grew up during a time where if you were a hard worker, you stayed there and you did hard work. Mm-hmm. And But if you were uh, substandard and kind of lazy, I'm going to say, the supervisor would send you off to some two-week whatever to get rid of you for two weeks because they didn't want to see that substandard soldier. But you're the good soldier and you're working hard while the substandard soldier is probably on a tasker for EF and B, and next thing you know, they get a, a AAM for helping out with EF and B, but you were here working, you know, instead of why why couldn't I work on that task or why couldn't I go to EF and B? Why couldn't I do this or that? Does that make sense? Roger that, Sergeant Major. So, what advice would you give uh, to someone that's in that situation on, on how to? tackle that to get those experiences or those taskers to to build up their resume instead of always getting the the jobs that that no one likes because they're a hard worker and they know they're reliable and dependable 
So I would I would think it's up to the first line leaders. I need the first line leaders. What I what I need the first line leaders to do is when they when they get their soldiers in, they should look at their SRB, right? They look at their SRB and every this is just me. Every year, if that soldier is in good standings, they need to fight for that soldier to have something on their on their SRB. Mm -hmm. And if that's and I like in my situation right now, code is making it hard for that, right? Due to COVID, I can't send soldiers to all these awesome training courses that I would have been able to a year and a half ago. So I, I got it that COVID is making it hard, but by no means should a soldier be at an organization, a good soldier be at an organization for three years and have nothing on their ERB. You are destroying their chance to be promoted because you go to the promotion board, they're going to look and see what kind of training you have and how often you've gone to training. And to them, it's going to appear like you're not trainable, right? Versus someone that has something on their ERB every year. And that and that's that's the responsibility of to me the first sergeant. The responsibility of the first sergeant is to get those soldiers in that are good soldiers that don't have anything on their ERB, but they need something. They need to send them the courses and making sure they go to school and um, maxing out on different things. Did I answer your question? Because that really came in broken. No, no, it did. So um, I would just ask again, what advice would you give to someone who feels that they're not getting those opportunities? Like if they came to you and and said that they're frustrated and they're they're just ready to give up. So the, the advice that I would give is to pull their career map, pull their SRB, and sit down with their first line leaders and explain to them or have their first line leaders explain to them how they're going to get promoted in the situation that they're in right now. I think like that's how I'm going to get promotion points for residential courses if I can't go to residential courses. You know, how, how I'm going to get promotion points for certifications if I don't have time to work on my certifications. There, there's certain things that you have to do to get promoted. And as a leader, it's, I, I think people have a, have a false view on leadership. When it comes to leadership, the subordinates aren't there to help the leader. It's the leader's responsibility to help the subordinates. It's my responsibility to prepare you to take my place because I'm not going to be in this position very long. So I got to make sure you're equipped, trained, and ready to step up and take my place if need be. So if I'm not equipping you, preparing you, training you properly based on whatever is going on, we are both grown. We are both soldiers. Nothing is stopping the subordinate from talking to their first line leader and, and getting a counseling statement. Like, you know what? I wanted in writing. Like I wanted in writing why I can't go to training. I wanted in writing why I can't go to aerosol. I wanted in writing why I can't go to EFB. Because I mean, we're big about documentation. We're good at counseling soldiers. We're not, we're not holding the standard. We're good at performing monthly counseling sometimes, but when it comes to per, career progression, counseling, we need to get better. It's not just, oh, I'm going to send you to the promotion board or no, you're not ready for the promotion board. It's this is what you need to do. And if I can't send you to these classes, these are these are the reasons why. And you want that in right now. So, so as a subordinate, what, what kind of conversation should I have with my first line supervisor in regards to um, promotion? Which, what should I focus on when I'm having that conversation? When it comes to promotion? Or just trying to professionally develop myself within the organization. Like how do I approach my first line supervisor without coming off across um, either so she or uh, disrespectful? So, you know, I would hope 
that every soldier has a good relationship with their first line supervisor and they can have this open communication and communication is both ways. So to come out um, non-threatening, I guess I would say, is you should at least be getting your, as a junior enlisted, you should at least be getting your monthly counseling. And as an NCO, you should at least be getting your quarterly counseling, correct? Roger, Sergeant Major. You should. So, yeah, you should be. Look, as a subordinate, you can tell, you can go to your first line and say, you know, I need to be counseled. I haven't been counseled, blah, blah, blah. You know that, right? Roger that. I mean, communication goes both ways. So doing those counseling sessions, which should, they should be planned and they should have um, some kind of structure to them. Y'all should be y'all should be able to talk about career progression as junior enlisted. Like I said, junior enlisted, I would put an SRB and career map for my E4, my specialist promotables and my staff sergeants. You know, I would add my promotion point worksheet to that and let them know, like, these are the areas that I'm missing points in as far as. Senior NCOs, you know, you should you should be performing your LPDs and your LPDs. Not only are you talking to your first line supervisor, but someone two grades higher should be mentoring you on on different attributes and things of that nature. How do you create motivation for yourself and your team? How do you get motivated every morning to put on the uniform and do what you do, Sergeant Major? Being a 68 tango. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to me, it's a it's a commitment. It's a, it's a commitment that I made. It's the oath that I took, right? When I when I joined the army, it's the it's the creed that I live by. Like, and that's what motivates me. I mean. If I if I didn't if I didn't like this job I wouldn't do this job if I, if I thought I couldn't um I thought I just think if I couldn't give it a hundred percent then it's it's not worth it anymore and that's what motivates me. what motivates me is I have a great group of soldiers I have a great group of motivated first sergeants that want to do a lot of things um. And once COVID is up, we, we will be able to do a lot of things, hopefully again, because working in uh, the hospital, I know there's a lot of competing priorities, but I well, I just feed off the energy of my first sergeants and they feed off of my energy. So, and my energy comes from my commitment to the oath that I made and my commitment to the soldiers that I promised to take care of. What advice would you give to someone who's who's struggling uh, professionally and personally? So if you if you're struggling, I would encourage you to talk to a few people, right? If if you're struggling emotionally, I will plead with you to go and talk to behavioral health. Um, there's nothing wrong with going to behavioral health. I will plead with you to go and see the chaplain. They're there for you. And it's not all hell and brimstones. They, you know, you could talk to the chaplain about anything. There's different programs that um, if, if you're struggling, that you can use. Um, struggle is a very um, serious issue right now. Because when I, when I think of struggling, I think of depression and then depression, if you're not getting help, you know, we got that MRT and you're just firing down and it becomes suicide. If you struggle, I will plead for you to get help. And, you know, if you go to one place and you're not getting help, you go to the next place and you keep going until you get help. And if you can't get help, you go to your first line supervisor who should be involved and they should be fighting to get you help. And if they're not getting you help, you need to go all the way up your chain of command or all the way up your NCO support channel. Because what, 
what I don't want to happen to happen is that we lose someone because they felt like they were alone and they're not alone. What are some of your daily habits that you feel create your success? <laughs> um, so I get up every morning, I have devotionals, um, not to be re religious or to um, offend anyone, but um, I do, I, I read the Bible, I pray, uh, I, I try to get my, I try to look at it, the schedule and see what's going on. When I get to work, I, I have my little routine. Whenever I get to work before I go and do my PRT, and then I come back before I go up to my office, I go and visit all the individuals that are working in the different companies in the orderly room. So now they're used to me saying good morning every to them every day and see how they're doing. I talk to them to see if there's any issues. I talk, I speak with the first time to see if there's any issues that we need to talk about or anything. Um, I let them know that I'm always open to them. And then I go to my office, look at my schedule, start my day. Um, but between each meeting, I, I make sure I get out the office and at, at least Weekly, we plan. The commander and I we plan to go. We go to a different section of the hospital just to visit the people there. When I say, and I say people, because it's not just soldiers there. There's civilians there. There's sailors there. So we go and visit the whole section. Uh, um, and then at night, and the evening, I come home. I, I reflect on what happened throughout the day. What I could do better. I do my nightly devotionals and I go to sleep and get ready for the next day. Would you do anything differently from a professional standpoint if you could go back in time? Um, I do anything differently. I was so since I've been in this service, I lost. I had a soldier, I had an airman who um, took his life by suicide once I left the organization. And if I could go back to that organization, this is before MRT and before, um, before we really focused on suicide. But if, if I could go back to that organization, I will, I will really, um, with what I know now, I would have really loved to have incorporate MR, MRT into that organization. Um, that would probably be the only change I could think of, yeah. What challenges do you see NCOs facing in the future? So, facing in the future. I would, so with it, each gener, each generation is different, right? Each generation is different. We're in a generation now where technology is like at the touch of your finger. So um, the challenge with NCOs is they really have to be on their P's and Q's. Like they really have to um, walk the talk. They 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 audio really have to match their video because they have the opportunity that if they slip up, that can go on the internet in a second and you are done. So you need to be true to yourself. And if this profession is not for you, then you might need to get out because I will tell you that as we move forward and technology is just getting more and more advanced that um, people are watching. And not only are they watching, they're talking to each other and not only they're talking to each other, they're, they're talking to like a whole group of soldiers across the whole 
nation to include Okona. So you really have to, you really have to love this job, really have to love the soldiers. You really have to be willing to train and, and motivate and coach. You, I mean, you, have, you really have to feel that. And, and if you honestly feel that you will display that and it won't be a challenge for you. But if you if you walk in a thin line and your morals aren't there and you know you're ethically wishy washy, it's going to be a challenge for you because the army is really um, beginning to take a long lens and look at the NCO Corps and the soldiers and um, and if you don't meet the standards, you're going to have to get out. What has been the best career decision that you've made? The best career decision? Well, so I came into the Army right after high school. <laughs> so that's yeah, all you just that's our picture. <laughs> Join the Army. What would you say, say would be one of your biggest accomplishments? What's my biggest accomplishment? So... I think my biggest accomplishment is um, when I get an email from a soldier from my previous unit and they thank me for something that I said or did or displayed. I mean, that's my biggest accomplishment. Okay, well, that wraps up my Q&A with you, Sergeant Major. This has been a, a real good pleasure, and it's, um, it is important for me to see someone who looks like me and also has the same, same MOS. Before we get off, can you just explain a little bit about how low density MOSs have a more challenging time um, with career progression versus bigger MOSs? Because I don't think a lot of people understand that concept. Um, so with the bigger MOSs, right, they have, since they are big, they're, they're more known. They're, they have more, um, I'm going to say airplay. And with that, if you have someone in a big MOS that doesn't understand the smaller MOSs, then that becomes an issue, right? Because in my career, sad to say, I've met a lot of folks that didn't know that the Army had animal care. And not only does the Army have animal care, we're the animal care people for all DOD, right? So we, we, we can go to Air Force bases, Navy, Marines. I mean, we're there. And it's sad because... People don't realize that. And so I had, the, the thing is, we have to educate them. I mean, we have to educate them. Like, when you go different places and they and you have to tell them, like, who you think taking care of those military working dogs? I mean, they, they don't think of a whole army. They think, like, oh, we're the big MOSs and everything caters to us. And, and it's, um, it's a real challenge. I would tell you the. Um, I think the good thing now is the way that MedCom is structured. That since each region has a public health command, I th I think we have a voice now. I I think that those um. Those region sergeant majors, as, as they speak with their public health activity sergeant majors, they, ha they have a better understanding because, let's be honest, without us, it could, it could possibly be a bad day. Does it make sense? Yes, it does, sergeant major. It does. Uh, I, th I think we, we're getting better when it comes to public health command and those senior leaders of those public health command, making sure they have a place at the seat, making sure they have, ooh, 
they have a seat at the table and making sure that they're they're speaking up on on our behalf. Because it's not just us, right? I, I think of the hospitals. I, I think of the x-ray techs and the pharmacy techs and all the folks that if they're not in direct, direct patient care, then sometimes they get left behind also. And, and so I, I think it's a real disservice to the small MOSs because they're fighting just as hard. They care just as much as those infantrymen and medics to make sure that our brothers and sisters are okay out there and that they get the best health care that's out there. And we just have to we just have to make sure we make our voice known in a positive way. Well, Sergeant Major, it, it's been a real pleasure um, having this conversation. I really want to thank you for your time out of your busy schedule for having this conversation with me uh, and, and shedding some light on some issues that we have within our career. I, I, I truly do appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Stop.